Uh, I am mortal of the battalion. But I do want to acknowledge the kind remarks that have been made about me and some of the things I have done and stand for. I um, want to pay my respects to the uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose lands we are gathered and on whose lands this wonderful city of ours is built. And every day in the Parliament we acknowledge that and it's a great thing. I want to also pay my respects to those of you, Excellencies and others uh, who are here and particularly those involved in the dialogue and discussions around religions for peace and harmony. Such a great challenge. But I also want to acknowledge my fellow parliamentarians, uh, Russell, uh, for the uh, kind words that he's had to say about me and for the limited onus that he's put on me to perform. But also to Deb, uh, my colleague, and to Senator uh, Jeanette Rice for, for being here as well. So, uh, And uh, if there are any other politicians that I've missed, uh, I want to certainly acknowledge them. Also to Mr Dean Sakhar Khan, uh, Chairman of the Canberra Interfaith Forum, and Professor Des uh, Kyle, Chair of the Religions for Peace. I come from a very, very sort of simple background. I was born and groomed in Western Australia in a period when Aboriginal people had no rights, when the marriage between an Aboriginal woman and an Aboriginal man required the permission of a, some, of a person called the protector of natives. And in fact, my father went to jail for taking my mother out of one of these institutions um, without the permission of uh, the native protectors. And they're only allowed to marry on the basis that they left the state of Western Australia and travelled across the border into the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory was deemed somewhat more enlightened from a social policy point of view than Western Australia was under the legacy of those native protectors and certainly its, its policy outlooks. I um, went to school in Catherine the Northern Territory, a little town, about 300 k's north, uh, south of Darwin. One headmaster, non-religious, but one where the basic values of humanity were clearly imparted by the headmaster through his leadership and courage. And there was racism in this town. And the Aboriginal kids weren't necessarily invited to come to all the school functions. And we not, certainly didn't have all the relevant clothing to attend school. We didn't have shoes, for instance. Um, and we didn't have housing that uh, we could dry our clothes in the wet, so we missed school hours and were penalised for, for such things. And the police were sent to round us up and bring us to school. But we also had a more enjoyable occupation of running away from school and going to helped the cattlemen who brought cattle into Catherine as a railhead to send to the overseas markets up in Darwin. And so we spent a lot of time helping the stockmen enjoy their lives and they were only paid five pound a month in those days, not a lot of money. And I witnessed a whole lot of inhumanity towards people. And racism as such wasn't something I clearly understood. I thought people were just ignorant, arrogant, superior, or thought they were superior. And because they had power and influence, could lord it over others. And it wasn't really until after 
I'd gone to secondary school in the western districts of Victoria at a little town called Hamilton, that I started to understand the clearer dynamics that underpin the nature of our society in Australia and the nature of the Aboriginal people's position within this country. And it was during this period, of course, that the referendum, the 1967 referendum, uh, was held and we were counted in the census, in the taking of the census of this country. And the Commonwealth Government was given a head of power to clearly show that it could make laws for people of the Aboriginal race. So the concept of race is clearly embedded in our constitution. And there was also a time when I learnt this Latin terminology. It's called terra nullius. And so I tried to study Latin to understand who this terra nullius or what this terra nullius was. <laughs> And there are many other concepts in Latin that I also wanted to understand, but certainly terra nullius. Having come from a proud people called the Yaru people, who lived in the northwest of Western Australia, and my grandfather had carried ceremonies, and I'd been to songs and dances, and witnessed many, many occasions when Aboriginal people were very much celebrating their own religious and spiritual beliefs absent of the dominance of the political structures. And so the culmination of a good foundation in primary school and a thirst to learn, I encountered with decent human beings across the spectrum and the Western Districts of Victoria I included in that because my parents had died subsequent to me going to the Western Districts. And it was the family there that I spent a lot of my holidays with because I couldn't go back to the Northern Territory. And this family um, basically adopted me within its structure, and they were pretty well off. There were you know, 10,000 acres, I think it was, in those days of land in the Western Districts, it's very good productive land, cattle, sheep, and around the area they, that lived, that, where they lived, and how the farmers, people like Malcolm Fraser, of course, you know, in that area, uh, the late Prime Minister of Australia. So it wasn't the poverty that I'd known in Catherine, where I had the social opportunity to meet and mix with people at all sorts of stratas, from the rabbit up, a man who grew up during the depression of Australia, never went to school, was surrounded by 30 or 40 terrier dogs on his rabbiting tours, uh, but he couldn't speak uh, English very well, but he was an Australian, couldn't spell. And a marvellous other old gentleman who grew up his family, he, was, he worked on the farms, he was a butcher, uh, sheep killing, dressing sheep, all of those things. So I learned from a range of different people over time and observed the behaviours of different peoples. And the bureaucracy would interface with the lives not only of these non-Aboriginal people but also of Aboriginal peoples. Because in the town of Hamilton at the time there was a little group of Gunditjmara people who came to everything that I was at as a boy, the sports, carnivals, etc. But we lived under this cloud that we were a dying race. That sooner or later we were going to disappear mysteriously from this earth. And so the concept of dying race, of terra nodiasis, land belonging to no one, the presence of what I knew as strong cultural leaders, including my own parents, my mother, my mother especially, my grandmother, and um, many others, and the strong leadership of people that I witnessed growing up with Vincent Lingiari, 
and others told me that we're not going to die out. The 67 referendum told them we're not going to die out because why would the Australian people vote so greatly in favour of the Commonwealth Government having this power to make laws for the Aboriginal peoples if we weren't going to die out? That was a simple logic. I'm a very simplistic guy. So my experience, and I went on to study in the Catholic faith, got ordained as a Catholic priest, and then worked in that ministry for a number of years. And it was the social distinctions that were brought to bear in the relationships that ultimately got me to question the relevance of the theology and the dogma and the teachings and the high aspirations of the New Testament and the realities on the ground of how is someone treated as an equal when you are served through the side door of a monastery refectory or when you were put into the, not the parlour, but into some other room to wait to be seen by whomever it was. So there was a distinction. And thankfully a lot of these traditions have gone. And hopefully the modern generation of peoples grow up under a different world. But that's, I'm just trying to give you some idea of the background of the world that I come out of. And I spent a lot of the time in the priesthood trying to deal with this dialogue between Christianity or Catholicism and Western policy positions, self-determination, integration, assimilation, these sorts of mantras that underpin public policy, but never really engaged in a dialogue or a dialectic with Aboriginal peoples about their perspective on any of this. They were the subject of debate amongst decision makers, very learned peoples, but never really in, the, um, in, a, in a dialogue with, with Aboriginal people. So I came to learn that, that there are some beliefs that have got tenets in common if we follow the Abrahamic traditions, that there are things in common with that tradition between those various religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there are some things in common, far more in common than they might be of difference. And there are others that are challenging and have challenging differences, Buddhism, Hinduism, against religious beliefs out of a Christian tradition. And there are some religions that are tolerant of the diversities that exist and the differences that exist. And there are others that are just intolerant, want to prosecute, persecute, condemn, incarcerate, subjugate people. And I don't think there's any one religion that can stand with pure hands in relation to this. Because I think they've all been culpable of these matters in their own various ways, you go to the Crusades, you go to the, the um, conquest of South America, all sorts of places. So I'm not trying to indicate that one religion is better than the other, but in the diversity of their belief structures, they can be more tolerant or less tolerant of difference and diversity. And most of that really is at the source of their cultural structures as opposed to their religious structures in many ways, their religious beliefs, I think. And often the, in the past, if we look historically, the motivation and legal justification for imperial nations taking over the lands of other peoples and subjugating them to their own roots in religious sanctions and being sanctioned by that. The papal bulls of the 1400s helped create the doctrine of discovery. 
which the imperial nations relied upon to take over other people's countries. And in this country, of course, was manoeuvred and manipulated to create this terra nullius concept by the British to take over the lands of the Aboriginal peoples. No one's here. No one belongs here. And therefore we can take it and make it ours. And even in those countries where there have been truth and reconciliation type commissions to try and deal with the underpinnings of these matters and the ongoing uh, outcomes for healing, we often find that nations and individuals within those countries are still left deeply scarred and mistrustful, often of the new political regime. So generally, First Nations peoples of Australia, we come from the sea or we come from coastal lands. We come from the rivers and the plains, the deserts and the stillers, that's the waterholes, from salt lakes and sand dunes, and the mountains and the stony country. So we are a diverse group of people from different geological, geographical locations, so that certain things will be emphasised within our religious beliefs and our certain reliances, we have certain traditions in those things. And lands and waters are usually referred to by our people as their country. Usually it's justified by an underpinning belief system founded upon something that we, the Yarra, call the Bulgarigo. Before time began, the creation of this world, the giving of form, to an unformed world. The creation out of nothing, basically, of languages, of peoples, of eminent domains, spaces, of kinship structures, of protocols of behaviour, ceremonial ways of celebrating the land. Now these, and different Groups of Aboriginal people have a different term. Bulgarigara for me is a very important term. It's not just dreaming, it's not just um, the beginnings, it's, it has this component of transcendence and imminence. It's there. It is part of the reality of life, my reality of life. And out of this, of course, the people who came to colonise this country had very little regard for this belief structure. They didn't understand it, they didn't see it. They didn't want to see it. They thought these people just danced around a fire and had some you know, fish that they caught for the day or killed a kangaroo. Or... They had no idea of the complexity and the interconnectedness of the people to the land through a complex spiritual understanding, evolving an ethic through kinship structures as to how people ought to behave and be accountable in their relationships to others, not only within their own communities, but those outside of that community, so that no one was ever left out. There's no one who was poor. There's no one who was an outcast. Everyone was integrated into that society with a status and was cared for. Now that was not seen as positive by columns, let me tell you. And so it had to be wiped out. It had to be wiped out. And that's why they created missions and settlements and, and religious orders of different bilks got involved in this process because they were so enmeshed in the political context of their existence as opposed to their religious truths and values. And some of them got involved to protect people from the slaughter that happened at the fingers of our society through the use of troops and police, etc. Now in these sun cycles, they're called often, this interconnection of the ceremonial and spiritual narratives, how this world was created, 
how I come to be a Yaru person belongs to a particular narrative of the Yaru people that gives me meaning and purpose and a sense of place and belonging in this world, despite whatever governments do to me, despite whatever they do. And we've demonstrated this against the whole world, as it were, under the native title regime, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. But having a uh, political shift to a legal determination uh, to the concept of Terra Nullius, and Terra Nullius being found as a legal fabrication in order to disinherit the Aboriginal peoples and to place upon them the principles and belief systems of the Western British society initially and then the colonists and the, and the um, settlers as they evolve with their various views of religion and uh, the meaning of man and his purpose. I don't think women have much concepts in any of these things initially. <clears throat> so, the, in, in the modern day native title claims, it's often the depth of the understanding of some of these complexities that a Western legal court is challenged to understand and it butts up against it, against the national legal framework, a national legal framework. And of course, it's Terra Nullius legacies, and we still are living through this in Australia, despite this being some years old now. Because the notion that Aboriginal people belong to this land and have property rights came as a huge shock to people in the 1990s when the Mabo judgment was handed down. So, to some degree, the religious context, and I speak in very broad terms when I use the word religious, blinded itself by its own beliefs to the possibility that the First Nations peoples of this country could actually have rights in land and weren't just nomadic like the leaf blowing around in the wind, but that they had sophistication and slowly we're becoming aware of this as Australians. And you'll recall the destruction of the ancient caves in the Pilbara region recently by Rio Tinto. Caves are only over 43,000 years old of human occupation of this land. And the finding of an ancient hair belt within the cave, which is seven to 8,000 years old, and that being used as a DNA test for contemporary Aboriginal peoples and finding the continuity between them. So the ancient, this ancient land and the ancientness of its peoples predate a lot of the Old Testament to some extent, or some of the Old Testament, certainly the New Testament. That doesn't mean it's any better or any worse, but it does mean that an ancient civilization in these lands here of Australia is still at risk by bad policies and bad laws that are made by our parliament. And we try to fix some of that as best we can. And we have differences often with the balance between the need for industry resource extraction and for cultural heritage protection. It's a huge challenge for all of us. So when we try to explain to a court that our belief systems and our social organisations have very little in common with the Greek or Roman philosophers, the pre-Socratic philosophers, or great thinkers out of those traditions. That we have very little in common in our tradition. We are not founded on those thinkers and the creation of their political institutions or the civilizations that have emerged from their thinking. We're founded from something quite different. We're founded from what I've called the Bulgaria, from this land, we come from here, our rai. Our rai comes from the land, from a place in the landscape 
that gives me my being and gives me obligations and responsibilities through my kinship structure to look after people and to share with others. And there were, there were ceremonial, I often think in the parliament when we blew them with each other, if we had a, a speaker or the person that controls the Senate or the person who controls the House of Reps, if they had the, if, if we modified just so gently the appetite for adversarial politics in our parliament by giving a role to those positions of speaker or president to do what we do in our ceremony is to have people who have the role to reconcile our differences before we have the argument or before we carry out the task that we're there to do on behalf of others. So that we come with a clean heart to the problems and the issues. We don't come with a heart that's trying to find how do we get the best of the other person in the argument for the sake of politics. So there are practical ways where some of the institutional structures that we've adopted in our society, and particularly in the parliament, we could we could change in, in very slight ways. But we've got to come out of a culture that acknowledges this as an important component to how we behave as civilised human beings. Because if we don't come out of that culture, and if we don't teach that culture, then we're not going to adopt it. And that's where the contribution of people of many faiths, many cultures, who make up the Australian society, um, we heard at the start that we're many communities. We are many communities, but our interconnectedness, based on the values of what we contribute, has got to have some transitional impact upon our polity and upon our constitution, ultimately, in this nation. We're dabbling with that, to some degree, because of the First Nations people's position. Voice, treaty, truth is something we're trying to get our heads around, or people are trying to get their heads around in the political space, a voice for the First Nations to the Parliament, truth-telling from colonial times to the implications and the legacies that that's produced up until the contemporary times. Now, in that, that just can't be a dialogue. It has to be a dialogue in the first instance with the First Nations and the government of the day. But it has to be also a way to incorporate people of the many faiths and many traditions that make up this wonderful country today. Because then we will become truly unique in the, in the politic of our reality as much as we do in our social realities. And we are very good in the social realities, but we're not quite there. And uh, the disappointment, for instance, I, I've got to say this, but the disappointment when criminalising people in India, Australians, uh, if they were to try to get back here, is as damnable as the attempt to remove people off the shores of Dunkirk would have been if we'd left people on the shores of Dunkirk and not made an effort to bring them home or bring them back across the channel in the Second World War. So, the traditions of belief, of truth, peace, is going to permeate our society in, a, in an honest and proper way. Otherwise, we pick and choose. We, we, we preference others and privilege others over, over other people in our society. When our people encountered theological doctrines, primarily coming out of Christianity, because we also had a social regime in this country which discriminated against relationships with people who were not Christians, particularly in my own town of Broome. So we had uh, Indonesian people, we had Malays, we had uh, 
Tim Reeves, we had a, who were part of the building industry. But they were not preferred as the people to marry. And in fact, there were social consequences if you got into a relationship with someone like that. But if you're a Filipino, or if you're someone else, or a Christian background, you were preferred. So you can see how the social fabric of this nation was so built around a Christian ethic, about a white Australia policy, and about upholding certain classes of values that were not going to be shared with others. And we are slowly awakening to this, thankfully for the contribution of many of the societies that you people belong to, and that uh, we in the First Nations have been pushing uh, about. So when we encountered theological concepts like the, the monotheistic nature of God, but yet somehow or other there's a uh, Trinitarian composition of this God, well that's, that's a bit hard to understand initially. And then when we came to this notion of the transubstantiation where bread and wine is transformed into the, into the body and blood of Christ in the Christian tradition, and the notion that good deeds being essential to your salvation uh, that underpin the various Christian beliefs, uh, when they come to bear upon First Nations, they appeared alien because of the way they were portrayed. But they, they were not unnecessarily unintelligible. We have many things in our religious traditions of transformation of people moving, levitating, doing some wonderful things within our culture. So the, the concepts aren't alien. When we break it down, what happens is that it gets marketed, or you get proselytised or missionized through the lens of the society. And that's where the problems start with us. So, it was the, these mysteries and the spiritual dimensions that made it possible for us as First Nations to contemplate such teachings. And recently I uh, spoke about a book that was launched in honour of uh, a man in Alice Springs who worked closely with the Arunda people. And we've come to realise that the endeavour of missionising people was being seen from a, an ethnocentric Western perspective, as opposed to being understood from the way that the Arana people were appropriating those religious beliefs into a structure of their own. So the fertility here for dialogue and for real understanding and real transformation is there. And it's mystery, it's, um, it's the spiritual dimensions. Some years ago, when I got frustrated with the politics of this country, I went to South Africa. Because Nelson Mandela had been let out of prison, and the people of South Africa were grappling with the concept of how were they going to develop their political structure. And I'd heard about these dialogues that they were conducting in various places, these scenario dialogues. And I went and met one of the men who was conducting these things to listen to, to how they were being done and how dialogue is different to consultation and, uh, and, and other means and, and how a real um, respect and understanding of another's point of view can lead to a, a common new reality, and not just a restatement of the old reality in order to sustain certain people in power. And I went with a good friend of mine, uh, John Sanderson, who was the governor of Western Australia at the time. And we came back to this country and said, there's been an apology made by the Prime Minister. We should use that apology to the First Nations to re-begin a dialogue with the First Nations and, and use scenarios planning, which is part of what we call truth-telling now, which we haven't quite got to, but we should go down a process 
of re-examining this relationship between ourselves and incorporating the better things that we're capable of. We know full well what our, the worst things for our societies are, but the better things, and how do we do this? And of course, the pragmatists in this country said, well, we don't really need to be looking at our neighbours to understand how we ought to behave to each other. And I said, well, that's going to be more of a pressure for us who are at the fringes of this society. So you can see how hard it is to get the dialogue between those in power and those not in power happening. But you can have the breakthroughs. So in these um, beliefs, and now I've only touched on a few of them, but there are there are other teachings, and one of them that often I think of is the words of St. Irenaeus, who spoke of the glory of God, and whoever God is, is man fully alive. So our task as humans is to help everyone be fully alive to the maximum of their potential. So how do we do that? How do we work towards enabling others to be fully alive enjoying the fullness of their talents and their gifts in the complexities of our societies and in that way give glory to whomever the Creator is. Now if we operated on that we would probably have a better society. I, um, I want to just talk a little bit about this concept we have which is called Leon. Leon. It's the innermost dimensions of your being and that innermost dimension of your being being attuned to the dynamics not only of interrelationships of humans but of humans' relationships to the environment to the world out there, to others, and how that sits within your Leo, in the innermost being. And the aim of life is to make sure that your Leo is at peace. And you know that by the contemplation, by the thinking, by the beliefs that you have. It's how you understand where you come from, your rye, your country, your place, and where you're going to go. And we have a belief that our body, of course, goes back into this earth, goes back into the land where we come from. Our rye goes back onto our country and will come back in someone else's human form, but will have characteristics similar to my own. But my being, my personality, or that attribute about me that makes me whom I am goes up into the sky, goes into the Milky Way and becomes one of those stars we look upon. And so there's no fear, there's no... The, the, the notion of death and dying, whilst they're sad personally, and we do grieve for our loved ones when we lose them, but we know there's a certain reality to that that extends beyond this temporal place. Whereas we've got an each way bet in the Christian system, whether we're going to get there or not get there, or whether we've already got there and we don't really need to do much about it here. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of <clears throat> rich uh, concepts, belief systems uh, within us, uh, and which we can, we can certainly um, we can certainly find. And this rich tapestry of, of not only the song and the ceremony and the stories, the narratives um, that deeply connect us to this land and these places and to each other, um, which was lost with the colonists. And, and we lose that at every point in our political journey in this nation when we fail to appreciate diversity and difference. And we fail to celebrate that for what it is, as it enhances 
what it is we are. And that's the contribution many of you make from your social and cultural backgrounds and your political stances. So I'll get towards concluding. The peace and harmony were not the motivating factors that laid the foundations for the relationships between First Nations peoples and the colonisers of this country. It didn't start with that foundation. And so the role of um, the importance of ethics and of honour and of achievement of fullness in the hearts and minds of peoples today is to some degree challenged by the physical richness of a nation. A nation as rich as ours should not have the levels of poverty that we see certainly in First Nations. We should not see the mendicancy of First Nations peoples in their own country, in their own places, reliant upon piecemeal services to ensure that their health is okay and the quality of goods being provided in order that they can physically survive. And we'll hear from the budget in the next day or so, but I bet there's not much in there that's going to say to the First Nations who live in remote parts of Australia where I come from, that your life is going to be tremendously different. Now, that's not a criticism of the government. The Labor Party would probably do the same. Because we do not form a great factor in our civil society. We've only formed a, a factor in the society because we've disrupted the legal framework of its tenure system through the High Court finding that there was a thing called native title that did not come from the British, but was here all the time. But it was failed to be taken account of by the colonisers. And now we're trying to unravel that. And we're trying to go back to the credit of those people in some of the states, in the state of Victoria, through truth commissions and through treaty commissions that have been set up and through the other states of Northern Territory and uh, um, Queensland, but they're the states, we're a federation, we've got to have a national perspective on all of this at some point, and we're slow to get there nationally because of all the political wrong reasons in my view. But we will get there, and we'll get there because people like yourselves and others know that this fundamental injustice, the injustice to the First Nations, has to be resolved Peace has to be constructed in order for us all to live in peace and harmony within these lands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I'd like to ask your permission whether you'd uh, accept questions. From sure. You or from sure. I'm in your hand. Uh, I've been asked the question about how can we get the politicians to um, respond and implement the uh, matters that came from the Uluru Statement of the Heart, Voice, uh, Makarata Commission for Truth Telling and Treaty Making. We do know that the government has been embarked upon a co-design process to develop legislation, and that's um, now going through a second round of consultations, and hopefully the Minister will report to the Parliament, uh, presumably once the Cabinet's had a look at what comes from the second round, uh, and July, August, we may see some draft bill put before the Parliament on a voice to the part to the government basically, but it can't stop a voice talking to the parliament. I mean, it would be ridiculous to do that. But it loses the nuance of a voice to the parliament, if it were to be adopted. 
you've got obviously people who believe there should be a new, there should be a referendum before there's any entrenchment or before there's any enactment of legislation. That we should create a new head of power or a new um, clause in the constitution to, to rely upon in legislating the voice because you'd have to rely properly on section 5126 of the constitution which is the race power which has got some legacy issues in it and uh, there's a um, there's a and, and as well as those who most of you remember the 67 referendum when there was a huge swell of the public who made it very clear to the Australian political leaders at the time, I think over 90%, that they wanted to change the section 5126 and they wanted the federal government to have power to make laws in relation to Aboriginal people. So that's significance of people's capacity to let governments know uh, that they are um, um, not happy with the slowness. And we saw this with the LGBTI legislation, which dragged along in the parliament for months upon months. Um, so the people have got a, a lot of different ways of making clear. And then gradually it also dawns upon uh, politicians who may be just ignorant and fearful. I know one of uh, the Liberal members He's got a book out, I haven't read that as yet, but he's got a book out on this subject. Um, whether it goes as far as treaty making, I don't know, but at least someone, and I know some good people in the, on the other side of politics who are seriously wanting to see more progress. So it's not always as clear cut as sometimes we believe, um, but we are dragging the chain. The fourth anniversary of the Uluru Statement is on the 27th, I think, of May. So it's four years since that statement was made. Now, I couldn't imagine anywhere else where a significant statement is made and an invitation made to the Australian people to walk with the First Nations peoples in a new journey with a moderate request uh, not to be passionately embraced, given the history. Um, uh, and, and go down a journey of healing and, and peacemaking and uh, agreement making and truth telling. And now, maybe we'll see in the next election um, how this pans out. But uh, from my party's point of view, from the Labor Party's point of view, we are committed to carrying out a referendum to entrench the voice in the Constitution, if we are elected, and to setting up a Macarada Commission of truth telling and of agreement making. Uh, we'll work closely with First Nations about that. Now, I know the Minister of First Nations at the moment is bogged down in these processes, but we'll wait and see what comes out of it. Can uh, people of faith help bring the dialogue to the surface? Okay, the, the question is, can people of faith help to bring the dialogue and the uh, resolution, I suppose, of the divisions between First Nations and the governments of the day to some kind of resolution. Is that what you're asking? And based on the promises made 30 years ago at Barunga for a treaty, <laughs> why did things go bad? Um, of course, people of faith have got a real role to play. And that's not, a, and that's not to go out and convert people, in my view. But it's, it, if you go back to that statement of St. Irenaeus, the glory of God is man or woman fully alive. That means being the best human being you can possibly be. You, me, being the best. The onus is on me or you in being that. It's not on me making someone else be that. So the notion that things can improve and it's not just the interpersonal relationship, this goes to the environment as well because the environment is what we all rely upon. And the relationship, if you simply have a look at the old story of Adam and Eve in the Bible, thrown out of paradise because of disobedience. 
and the purpose of the incarnation, the Christian tradition, of God becoming man, was to send the message that there has been a healing between God and human beings and God and creation. And now man has got to find a way to heal with creation and his fellow human beings in a positive and constructive way, knowing full well that there's salvation that's taken place. There's a guarantee of that. Now, the good news of the gospel gets filtered through the political imperatives and the social imperatives of a society. And it's the courage of religious peoples, whatever the good news is within the scriptures or the teachings you have about a salvific moment for human beings and creation before the Creator or by the Creator. That is the thing that has to be emphasised. And then people will find they're less judgmental about other people and you have to make the reforms necessary in your own life to be true. And being true to yourself helps others understand. And not walking away. It's a bit like any of the campaigns you see. You know, no more domestic violence, no more putting women down. All of these things are very important to stand up for the values. And that's what religious people should be doing. We've got time for one more question. Culture, what is culture according to me? Culture takes many forms by humans creating it. Um, culture is social norms that you develop in a society of how you either relate to people, how you care for people, how you um, respect diversity and difference. What are the rules, the regulations, the protocols, the behaviours that you uh, and the celebrations that you make and the forms that that celebration takes. Um, and they'd, they'd be unique to different human societies. Uh, but there'd be certain things that'd be in common amongst cultures. The, the celebration of a newborn child is something in common. We might all celebrate that a bit differently. We might smoke that child, we might bless that child in different ways. But the fact that we have a ceremony or a practice that goes with how we look after that child is part of the cultural norms. And the birth of a child is not just into a single family, but into a matrix of relationships. So he has many mothers, he has many fathers, or she has many fathers and mothers. And they're not all necessarily blood related. So in our kinship structure, there are people who are not Yarra, but whom I relate to, going from Broome to Alice Springs, whom I call brother, sister, uncle, auntie, mother-in-law, sister, wife. They come from different languages. They live in different. They live in the desert. I live in the sea, on the coast. But my culture enables me through our kinship structure to relate to all people and know my relationship and my protocols and behaviours that I should. Uh, perform or carry out when I go into their country. So I'm not just barging in to take over their places. So there are, there are rules to culture as, well, as much as there are celebratory factors. Um, so, but each of us will know that from the cultures we come from within. Would you thank Patrick Dobson again for his <laughs> <laughs> Patrick and I have both learned after many years on the public stage, it's not the entrance you make onto the stage that's dangerous, it's the getting off. <laughs> it's always dangerous. Thank you, Patrick. I told you you get something special tonight, and it certainly has been very special. Dean, would you join us and say a few words, please? Senator, for the wonderful talk that you and uh, 
uh, presented tonight. Um, don't get too nervous or don't get too um, <laughs> worried about my couple of pages of full scripts up here. I don't know if they Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, on this topic of reconciliation and uh, multi faith, it took me back to a, a talk that I gave previously that regrettably religion has become or is used as a source of all conflict and uh, animosity towards each other. King Abdullah II of Jordan, he said this in the United Nations General Assembly in New York. And I thought it was lovely. He said, it is also essential to resist forces of division that spread misunderstanding and mistrust, especially among peoples of different religions. The fact is, humanity everywhere is bound together not only by mutual interests, but by shared commandments to love God and neighbor, to love the good and neighbor. Religion plays a very uh, vital, crucial role in life, whether it be in politics or otherwise. Religion guides us to the path of honesty, or so it should, integrity, and high morals, and inspires us to live a righteous life. Many people around the world are guided by the religion and keep themselves away from evil and do good. And this leads to the path of the path of honesty, integrity. It all leads to reconciliation. And reconciliation amongst people of different faiths. Unfortunately, what, even though we have a lot of saints, prophets, people of integrity, scriptures, they teach us all the good things, of course. But unfortunately, the same lessons, the same scriptures are misused by people for their personal gain, for their personal agenda. And we have seen that these people divide society in the name of religion for their own vested interest. And that leads to division rather than any attempt of getting close to reconciliation. We have seen intolerance by all faiths, as the Senator, Honorable Senator, Senator has mentioned. And no, no faith if you look at history, is exempt from this allegation. Religious harmony, or shall I call it uh, reconciliation, uh, holds the key to a peaceful and progressive world. It brings about re reconciliation in a multi-faith world. It is a prayer which is a common prayer for us all to hope for a, a world that where we can work together to create a religiously harmonious society by knowing and practicing our own faith but at the same time respecting the others. Religious harmony holds the center stage for peace and prosperity. And the basis for human interfaith harmony comes from honesty, humanity, which is to love God 
and love the neighbor is King of Jordan said, the love of good and love of the neighbor. Religious or interfaiths are, of course, uh, supposed to mean that, that to bring people towards each other, to create harmony, love and compassion towards each other, to both understand and appreciate that we are all creatures of the same Creator. To love, care and look after each other. And these are the factors should be borne in mind. And if we practice and take these factors into account, they will as of necessity lead towards reconciliation. The Canberra Interfaith Forum, uh, of which I'm uh, proud to say this is the chairperson of the forum. We promote open conversation between various spiritual faith traditions based on equality and mutual respect. And that can bring about reconciliation. And our vision of the Interfaith Forum is to the objective and purpose is to educate each other. Our practice in educating each other and understanding each other and removing all the misconceptions that we have against each other. And it is all about misconception and that is due to ignorance. I note the emphasis by, by the Senator Dobson in his comments. And what I thought would be a good take on this is this. That before we can, or we claim to be a good Christian, or a good Hindu, or a good Muslim, or a good Jew, let's first of all become a good human being. And I think the rest will follow like a zipso pasal. Thank you. I really apologise to our people on Zoom. That was Dr. Uh, Khan, who is the chair of the Canberra Interfaith Forum. Now, I won't get this wrong, Des, I better tell the Zoom people what's going on here. Uh, our next speaker is the chair of Religions for Peace, Professor Desmond Carlhill, OAM. Thanks, Des. Well, thank you, Russell, and I hope that my uh, bronchial condition will outlast this um, somewhat cold Canberra evening. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the original inhabitants of the land on which we stand tonight. Uh, I want to thank Patrick, Senator Patrick, for what he has said tonight, because I think it was part of, a, of an attempt by Religions for Peace to show that we want to engage a lot more with the First Peoples issues and the process of reconciliation and social cohesion. And we will be having at our annual general meeting in a few weeks time another First Peoples person speaking from Queensland on the Zoom process, but what I liked about what you said was the intersection of the legal, the political, the cultural, and the spiritual. And so much of that was got wrong going back centuries, not only just in Australia, but also in Latin America and so on, and other places around the world. And I think it's a call, really, for all sections, the legal, the political, cultural, and the spiritual, to relook at their traditions, to rethink them in the light of what um, the issues that now face us. Um, I'll come back to that. Usually, on these occasions, I talk a little bit about 
the um, activities of Religions for Peace Australia. It's been an eventful year with COVID-19 and as an organisation we've made a lot of representation to state and federal leaders. We were particularly concerned about uh, temporary visa people and how they were faring uh, during the, particularly the early months, international students, some of whom went hungry, and other temporary visa people. And we're now bringing out a statement on vaccine uh, hesitancy, because I think it's important that religious leaders speak about that issue quite openly to encourage the Australian people to take up vaccines. Um, a big negative for us this year was that Griffiths University decided to close the Centre for Interfaith Dialogue and Culture. And uh, basically because of financial reasons and all universities are experiencing this. My own university of RMIT down in Melbourne has sacked 1,400 people. Um, and so a lot of our courses and subjects will disappear. And that's true in other universities. But that um, has been a great loss to us. Uh, because they were our Queensland affiliate under Brian Adams. This year also, um, we've played a significant role in the activities of ACRP, the Asian Conference of Religions for Peace, also known as Religions for Peace Asia, which has 21 member nations. And uh, we represent over half of humanity because we have India and China as well as little Australia as members. And we'll have little Timor Leste a member in a few months' time. But we've been, we've had a negative thing there. We did a lot of work through our secretariat in New York, which works very closely with the United Nations in bringing, as they called her, the, the big lady, um, and the generals in Myanmar. But that work has now seemingly gone down the drain. And last year we celebrated 50 years of Religions for Peace, which is the world's largest interfaith organization across the world, with 94 uh, national chapters. Um, we have very good relations with China and the China Committee on Religions for Peace. Uh, we've gotten very well over the years and they're now lobbying us to support them in coming um, elections in October at the Asian Assembly. And we're still thinking about that but we do have very good relations with the Chinese leadership there. And for example, I know uh, the two leading archbishops of the Catholic Church in China, after the agreement between the Vatican and the Chinese government in September 2018, and how the new system is working okay. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, China is not an easy country to work with, and I speak that from experience over many years. But we do have very good relations. I can't s say that often enough. And yet, to be blunt, DFAT's not very interested. I briefed them twice in the last 10 years and you never, never hear anything more. Whereas the German government and its um, foreign affairs ministry now thinks that religion is part of the solution, not part of the problem. 
which I think is very interesting. Um, recently, we've become involved with the, the Honourable Alex Hawke, Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, who is formulating a social cohesion statement. And we've been invited to be part of that process. And so I hope that that um, will work out uh, because the draft statement does make allusions to references to Australia as a multi-faith nation, which we are. And we've tried to emphasize the primacy of neighborhood because I think the pandemic has shown that when we're all locked away, we still have our neighbours. And I think that was, was, has been very important. And we've made three recommendations to Minister Hawke. One, we're beginning a process with religious leaders across Australia to form an interreligious council of Australia because we became conscious during the pandemic, that the lines of communication between the government, whether at federal or state level, vary greatly across Australia. And there needs to be a better mechanism for that to take place. What form that will take is yet to be decided. But I'm very aware of nations like Singapore and um, South Korea having those kinds of um, interreligious councils. Secondly, we need to broaden the chaplaincy program, which is now focused on schools. But um, there's a crisis in chaplaincy across the nation for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into as a result of our research. But I think that it needs to be extended to other areas prisons, um, emergency services. As one example, Ambulance Victoria has recently appointed um, a highly experienced person to rejuvenate its chaplaincy program because many of the ambulance officers are suffering from PTSD and a chaplain is felt, or spiritual carer, is felt as a very important person in coping with that kind of situation. Victoria Police, the same. Um, and set, lastly, we need to um, have induction programs for newly arrived immigrant religious leaders because they step into leadership positions. In the spirit of the evening, I want to finish, if I may, Patrick, with a reading from Miriam Rose Ungume, who is now the Australian, or the Senior Australian of the Year. Um, and she talks about the practice of the deer, Aboriginal contemplative listening. She writes, the dairy recognizes the deep spring that is inside us. We call on it and it calls to us. This is the gift that Australia is thirsting for. It is something like what you call contemplation. When I experience the dairy, I am made whole again. A big part of the dairy is listening. My people are not threatened by silence. They are completely at home in it. They have lived for thousands of years with nature's quietness. My people today recognize and experience in this quietness the great life-giving spirit, the father of us all. Our Aboriginal culture has taught us to be still and to wait. We do not try to hurry things. 
We wait on God. His time is the right time. We wait for His Word to make clear to us. We don't worry. We are river people. We cannot hurry the river. We have to move with its current and understand its ways. We hope that the people of Australia will wait. Not so much waiting for us to catch up, but waiting with us as we find our peace in this world. There is much pain and struggle in this world, but it is time for rebirth, to fulfill, not to destroy. If our culture is active and strong and respected, it will grow. It will not die. We know that in time and in the spirit of the dear, that deep listening and quiet stillness, his way will be clear. We are asking our fellow Australians to take the time to know us to be still and listen to us. And I believe that the spirit of the deer that we have to offer will blossom and grow, not just within ourselves, but in our whole nation. Thank you. We would joyfully like to thank all the speakers this evening that have presented. You've been a blessing to us. Patrick, Julie, if you've got the, a little thing to give to Patrick. Um, Julie, the secretary, is now making a small presentation to Patrick Dodson for all those on the Zoom. Uh, in the spirit of uh, reconciliation, despite the contest that rages on the hill not too far from here, I think it's really important for people of faith and people of no faith across this country to know that the relationships we build there through our common humanity and sharing in these parliamentary friendship groups is a reminder to us as well as a call to us to be the kind of people on the journey that Pat's described for us to be this evening. Always a great goal to be a good human being, whatever religious tradition you might come from. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Senator. And that concludes the evening, except you can spend time together now. There is COVID safe food packages for you here, which is really new and interesting for, um, especially for our diplomatic corps. So I, I, can assure you, I can assure you it's very diplomatic food. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you.